you know uh, our center has been very active in organizing events related to europe and the eu and to large extent i think these events have been made possible because of the support from the eu our center has also been one of the largest uh, recipient of the yomone activities in terms of uh, yomone chairs modules network and of course the center of excellence and i must congratulate uh, professor bhastri sarkar who has been recently awarded yomone chair in democracy diversity and european identity in the eu and this i think is the first major activity from the chair and i'm glad that uh, she has chosen a very important topic for the young researchers conference concerning immigration and europe and this workshop has uh, provided uh, opportunity not only to large number of our own research scholars but also from other departments and also outside jnu and since the early 90 early 50s you know europe has seen different phases of immigration uh, till the early 70s i mean the guest workers for european reconstruction as well as settlers from uh, former colonies dominated this flow in the 70s and 80s uh, guest workers declined but legal migration to family reunification continued and in the 90s and the immigration from central and eastern europe surged uh, in addition i think the seasonal mobility for low end jobs as well as irregular migration also increased in the last 20 20 25 years i think the immigration to europe has become more diverse there has also been uh, refugees initially from iraq and afghanistan and also recently from syria Uh, low skilled undocumented irregular migration has also increased and there has also been surge in student mobility and eu is also itself trying to attract highly skilled migrants to europe in the last few years as a result of sudden sudden surge of refugees and irregular immigrants i think the migration and refugee issues are top of the european policy agenda and as as you all know the issue became very serious after massive influx in 2015 it was also termed as a one of the major crises facing the eu and there has also been debate about securitization of migration now due to its demographic profile i think most eu countries will continue to source outside labor particularly skilled workforce and if we have a appropriate policy framework i think india is in a right position to provide required workforce to eu countries because of its youthful population as and an elaborate higher educational infrastructure at the eu india level since 2016 uh, we have this eu india common agenda for migration and mobility and the major focus is on uh, establishing a framework for attracting talents and students to the eu and also on finding ways to improve orderly mobility and checking irregular migration as you also know that india is also in the largest beneficiaries of uh, erasmus plus program for higher education scholarship and cooperation between indian and european universities and i'm glad that professor vinod khadaria has agreed to be keynote speaker for this conference Uh, professor kadaria as you know has done a lifetime work on migration related issues unfortunately we are meeting virtually yeah. due to the restrictions uh, this is really disturbing you know that you know our new batch of students with who, whom we are interacting we have met many of them only through online mode but i promise that you know whenever university is opened Uh, we'll find ways to compensate for all the conferences lunches and dinner you might have missed during this pandemic <laughs> uh welcome again and now i invite uh, professor bhaswi sarkar to introduce theme of the conference professor sarkar thank you gulshan thank you all for being here
Uh, Gulshan is right. This is the first uh, event of the many events planned under the Germany chair for uh, democracy, diversity, and European identity in the European Union. Uh, Gulshan talked about the issues of immigration because this is what the subject is of, of this present conference. But I think today it is also important to focus on the question of democracy itself. And uh, because if democracy is about uh, citizenship rights, if it is about justice, if it is about equality, if it is about liberty and freedom, then some of the organizations uh, which uh, measure democracy across the world, uh, for instance, uh, democracy index or freedom in the world, uh, they show that so far as the democratic health of the world is concerned, we are not in a good place. So when we talk about human mobility and, uh, and you know, movement of people, the kind of societies, receiving societies, the temper and temperament of the receiving societies become important. And if the democratic health of the world is not good, uh, then it is worrisome. Uh, for instance, the 2021 report of freedom in the world indicates, uh, and it's actually its uh, title itself is very telling. The title of this report uh, of 2021 is Democracy Under Siege. And it goes on to argue, or it goes on to you know, tell us that uh, in the last 15 years, uh, there has been a continuous decline in global freedom. Uh, 2021 is, the, is again another year which has shown a decline in global freedom. And what it uh, warns us that there is a deep democratic recession. Uh, and this is going to be a, bit, a difficult thing when we are talking in terms of societies and uh, you know, in terms of acceptance of the other. Uh, it is therefore clear to my mind that when we talk about democracy uh, as a system of organizing political life, we can see about, uh, you know, when we look around that it is something we cannot take for granted. If we look at, uh, you know, Europe itself in the, uh, after the uh, end of the Cold War, uh, what we saw was a triumph of democracy, so to say, march of democracy. But we are not sure where it is placed today in terms of how the societies which became democratic are progressing. Uh, because if you look at the post-Cold War enlargement scenario, then we see that uh, for at least some of the new member states, um, uh, you know, their commitment to democracy has, appears to be questionable. So for instance, when Viktor Orban talks about illiberal democracy, as a way, as a way for Hungary, as a vision for Hungary, uh, then we can see that the democratic triumph and the democratic march of democracy has, so to say, reached a roadblock. It has, so to say, uh, you know, kind of a hit a pause button, if not a halt button. And to my mind, the problems which we are facing as democratic uh, societies all, is also related to the fact that uh, the optimism, the sparkle and sheen of globalization appears to be wearing off. And if you look across societies and people uh, at large, we see that societies and people uh, you know, are kind of anxious, withdrawing and looking inward. And internally also the societies appear to be more polarized and uh, revolving around the narratives of us and them. So when we talk in the larger aspect of immigration, this kind of an understanding of us and them uh, is something which needs to be, uh, you know, it, it is something which, which becomes problematic. And I think uh, it, this, is, this also becomes clear when we look at um, the kind of um, uh, response to the refugee crisis of 2015. If we look at Europe itself, Europe looked divided and the, and the, and the kind of response, as we know, ranged from, you know, uh, unconditional welcome to complete rejection. So this is something which we need to keep in mind when we are talking about questions of mobility. And to my mind, the divisions that came up in 2015 are something which is uh, one can understand by looking at what has been happening over a period of time uh, as Europe seems to be struggling, the European societies seem, seem to be struggling with accommodating uh, the di uh, diversity it has actually come to represent in terms of different cultures, in terms of different uh, traditions, norms, even values, and, um, uh, 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 and religious groups. So we have seen this struggle and we see today that European societies, for European societies, uh, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and terrorism have all become a reality and all our problems when we are looking in terms of a larger canvas of um, mobility and immigration. 
uh, uh, Ernest Gellner, when he was talking about, you know, uh, the rise of nation and nationalism, he um, he was explaining it, uh, and and he said, and in, in his explanation, he talked about the in, uh, coming of the industrial society, and he talks of that once the industrial society becomes a reality, uh, agrarian society is no longer an option. So to my mind, once globalization has become a reality, I don't see uh, us actually turning back. I don't see uh, uh, us living in a deglobalized world. And if we are not going to live in a deglobalized world, the questions that it raises in terms of diversity, in terms of human mobility, uh, they, they, they are here to stay. We need to address them. They are, as I said, here to stay. As someone has uh, uh, said, immigration is something, is like a leaking tap. You know, you really can't turn it off. And if you can't turn it off, then the kind of questions that it raises, the issues that, is, that it raises, the anxieties that it generates, because it does generate anxieties. So all of this need to be addressed. It is with this in mind and the kind of um, work which is being done by the students in the center, looking at these issues from various aspects, political, economic, and social, that we thought of organizing this Young Researchers Conference on immigration and Europe, uh, you know, uh, trends, uh, shifts, and perspectives. And I think uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, Ambassador Astuto here with us today, uh, because I think he's the best person to tell us how EU positions itself on questions of immigration, how it balances its need uh, for you know, labor uh, with the kind of rising um, anti-immigrant sentiment that you see in, uh, in uh, EU member states and EU's own commitment to norms and values. Uh, so I think he'll be the best person to tell us about this. And I'm also so happy to have uh, Professor Vinod Kadiria with us. He's, an, as Gulshan said, an established expert in the field of migration studies and, uh, in the, and also sorry, special belonging to the JNU family. So he's, he is special. Uh, and I think uh, that we will all, uh, you know, um, learn much from um, the, uh, what, we, what we hear from our distinguished guests this morning. And I hope that both our guests will leave us with hope that uh, we will live in a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bharti Sarkar, you know, uh, for outlining this whole broad agenda for this Young Researchers Conference. And all kinds of issues from diversity to mobility to democracy to human rights, I think you have very, and globalization, you have put in very, very appropriate places. And if I can look at the agenda of the conference. Uh, this also, to some extent, showcases, you know, the, our strength of our Center for European Studies. Uh, in fact, most of the scholars, those who are presenting, uh, they are, uh, you know, our PhD students. Of course, I mean, there are also some of them from outside and some of them, those who are passed out and then now they're working in other think tanks in Delhi and other places. Uh, so this also shows that, you know, the kind of uh, serious work on Europe, which is required in India, and, you know, we have been able to contribute something, hopefully, meaningfully, to this larger debates, uh, not just only about uh, EU-India affairs, but what is happening inside Europe, and also looking things from European perspective, because in area studies, you know, just before we started, you know, we were discussing, I mean, uh, area studies per se in India is, uh, you know, uh, they're a bit of a crisis because of lack of funding from the UGC and from other sources. You know, we are relatively lucky and uh, uh, because, you know, because of all the Erasmus programs and the support from the EU, and we have been able to continue our programs. And we have, as a result, you know, our students, uh, PhD scholars, have also been able to you know, visit many European uh, uh, cities. Uh, but that's not the case with many uh, other European uh, and sorry, uh, other uh, area study programs. Uh, since the time is limited, uh, may I invite uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Ugo Astuto, which you know most of uh, most of the our students anyway uh, know him because he has been very regular uh, visitor to our center for many many years. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sashdeva, Professor Sarkar. Thank you, thank you all, all participants for inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to be invited at conferences um, organized under the, the, the banner of the Jean Monnet program. As you said, Professor, a successful action under the EU flagship uh, program for academic exchanges, uh, Erasmus um, uh, Plus. So let, let me praise um, the, the, the young researchers who 
who got into this very sensitive uh, topic of migration. And let me congratulate um, uh, you for, for having guided the students and organizing these two days of um, exchanges. Now, now the, the, the headlines of the presentation that I saw in the programs focus on mostly on the negative feature on uh, titles such as crisis, fear, anti-immigration, Islamophobia, far right. In a way, I guess um, it's inevitable. And I, I'm certainly not going to, to deny that the European Union, as other complex societies, the European Union is also facing serious issues linked to um, immigration and it, it, its impact on, on society, on society overall. But I, I feel that the story is broader than that. And I will also try to, to offer this dimension in my presentation. And if you allow me, I will start from the very beginning by, by recalling that the, the European Union born in the 1950s is, is, not, is, not, a, is not alien to, to these large phenomena of, 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 uh, of migration, of, of, of large scale movement of people, because when the war ended in 1945, the, the war generated more than 20 million refugees uh, for Europe and tens of millions more people who were subject to transfers across borders um, uh, following the, 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 the traumatic re reshaping of, of political maps. So the deportations, depatriations, repatriations were, were a trauma of uh, immeasurable proportion for, for Europe. But, but I, I mean, I'm, this was not unique to Europe and this part of the world obviously had to experience similar experiences more or less at the same time. But this is simply to say that um, from the very start, the European project has been shaped by, by these um, traumatic experiences and the EU core vision remains basically never again, never again. So our, our founders have, have sought to replace conflict with, with dialogue and confrontation with, um, with peace based on, on common values and the rules of law. Um, the disatos, um, I think, remains the red thread um, uh, running through uh, all treaties and actions and uh, activities of the European Union, be, be they domestic or, or external. So the respect, um, the respect for human rights and, and for, 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 for values, um, uh, as well as the, the, the idea of, of pursuing um, a social market economy, well, these are, these are factors that, that can explain also, I believe, the present attractiveness uh, of the European Union for, for, for migrants. Mm, but, but when it comes to, to broad principle, I think it's important to recall that the European Union defends the right, um, um, the right to apply for asylum uh, in, in a way which is in line with the, with the Geneva Convention. And we welcome those in need of international protection, or we try to at least. The, the European Union is a major partner of, the, of HCR, um, we, we offer significant financial support to HCR and political engagement to, to address the refugee flows uh, within the EU, within the neighborhood um, and, uh, and on the global scene. And we are also um, a strong supporter financially and politically of the International Organization for Migration and its mission to promote uh, humane and, uh, and orderly uh, migration. Now, as you, as you said earlier, uh, global migration flows have, have increased um, dramatically over the past uh, decade. And uh, I, I, again, as you said, Professor, I, I think we can expect this trend, this trend to, to remain. Uh, wars and conflicts, but also poverty and um, economic instability um, have been uh, important push factors, driving factors in this phenomenon. Um, and we, 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 we are we are not really deeply concerned to see that um, irregular migrants are exploited by criminal organizations um, and, uh, that, that take advantage of supply to, of thousands to, to gain illicit, illicit gains. Um, uh, however, uh, migration should not only be seen uh, through the lenses of crisis, uh, and it's important to recall that most uh, migrants um, who come to the EU do so legally. Uh, in 2019, um, almost 3 million residence permits uh, have been granted to their country nationals, uh, including uh, 126,000 Indian uh, for, for work, family, family reasons, study and research purposes. Um, in, in addition, Although we are, we are living through peculiar times and the COVID-19 pandemics has, has almost halted uh, legal migration, 
but but the international mobility continues to be to be important uh, to, to address societal challenges and to take advantage of the positive aspects of, of globalization um, uh, circular migration mobility across countries uh, can develop people to people links across the globe and and in turn this helps to for mutual understanding um, and to be more open uh, towards um, and across um, culture. Uh, in, in 2019, more, more than 20 million uh, third country nationals were residing in the European Union, 20 million. Uh, this represents more or less 4.7% of the total uh, EU population. And, and it's only part of the diversity that you can find in the European Union if you consider that um, uh, 40 million people residing in, in the European Union were born outside the, the Union. And among them, let me, let me re re recall here a few, a few bright examples. Then, uh, Mr. Ugur Shahin, bo born in a small city in Turkey, who came um, at a young age to Germany, and, and together with his wife, uh, Oslem Turecci, uh, the daughter of another Turkish immigrant, they, they founded the company Beyond Tech. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with this name because it, it's a company which has developed it. It fights a, a vaccine in, in record time in, in a German laboratory. But this is only a very recent example. There are a few more uh, that um, shed a bright light, let's say, on the perspective of migration to, to the EU. Uh, a perspective of opportunities and of um, successful integration for migrants and their descent. Um, these are perspectives that I believe the Prime Minister of Portugal, Antonio Costa, and, and the Minister of Health uh, in Ireland, um, uh, Leo Varadkar, uh, who are both of Indian descent, who would, uh, would personally endorse, considering their, their personal story. So th this is a fact, but uh, this is not to belittle the, the integration challenges that the European countries are facing. Uh, all of them also on different uh, scales. Uh, and, and we definitely cannot deny the, the, the divided uh, potential of, uh, of issues related to, to, to migration. But, but it's important also, I believe, to, to exemplify that well-managed migration does enrich society as enriched um, European society with new talent and uh, with diverse uh, uh, cultural background. So in, in a nutshell, uh, as, we, as we all know, migration is, is a complex issue. Um, cooperation in the field of migration and asylum within the European Union is relatively young. Um, the, the EU gained competence on these fields in 1999. Um, and the idea of a European approach to migration is, is, is not an easy one, uh, as, as migration touches them upon um, um, the core, the very core of national sovereignty, and, and remains a very emotional topic uh, among the, the, the general public and in political circles. But we are learning, uh, and we are, we are building from, from experience. And, and recently, in September 2020, the European Commission has presented a new pact on migration um, and asylum, which, which is based on, on, on three pillars. Well, first, um, um, the external dimension is about engaging with international partners and, and cooperating with, um, with their countries on, on readmission. And, and this is on top of, um, of, a, of the EU longstanding um, uh, engagement in peace building and, and economic development. Uh, as you know, the European Union is the, the first provider worldwide of um, um, uh, international development funds across the globe. And that's, this is directed at tackling instability, poverty, and lack of um, economic aspect. But the, the second, um, the second uh, pillar is a, is, a, is a resilient, robust, and fair management of the external borders, um, channeling uh, people quickly through the right procedures. Uh, while at the same time fighting criminal gangs, uh, gaining illicit profit from the suffering of thousands. And thirdly, the third pillar, a strong solidarity component with member states um, uh, most confronted to, to migratory challenges. The, the, the new system, uh, very importantly, let me stress that includes uh, credible legal migration uh, and integration policies. 
because we, we, we remain convinced that this will benefit European societies and economies now and in the longer term. Um, as, as, a, as a general rule, uh, the European Union tends to learn from, from crisis, from, from the crisis it confronts uh, with. Um, this is also the case with, uh, with migration, I believe. The, the crisis in 2015 was, was mentioned. Uh, I think since then we, we, we have been trying to progress and to learn from our mistakes and we, have, we are coming up with uh, new governance methods and practical solutions and, and schemes. So let, 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 me, let me draw to a conclusion here. And um, I think I, I have very honestly to say that we have not found the, the magic recipe to address um, migration challenges. We, we have not. Um, we are trying, um, we, we are learning by doing, let's say. Uh, and the policy debate underpinned by academic and scientific uh, analysis is necessary. Uh, well, this has to continue. That's why initiatives such as one are, are always useful. And I, I, I hope that your research can also help in getting a better understanding of the situation and, and possibly giving indication on the possible evolution and, and further steps to, to take. So it's important to balance the perspective and, and, um, and, and see um, uh, together the, the, the challenges and the opportunities of, uh, of migration. And here, let me, let me conclude on, on a note of optimism, if I may, in, in the sense that um, uh, you, you have thousands of people voting with their feet for moving, moving to, you, to Europe. And uh, that there must be, there must be a positive, uh, there must be positive pull factors uh, at play, no, not just economic, I believe, but living in a, in a fair, uh, equal, democratic society, respectful of human rights and fundamental freedom must be part of the, of the attraction. Um, and here, let me anecdotally simply refer to the news we have all read in newspapers recently about uh, nine out of the ten first uh, happy society in a, in a, in a recent ranking uh, are, are from are from Europe. So, on, on a more serious note, uh, let, let me let me quote Jean Monnet, um, one of our founders, and uh, when he said that I very often quoted, "Make men work together, and show them that beyond their differences lies a common interest." This is a very practical, down to earth. Um, uh, proposition, which we have been trying to follow repeatedly in our history. Uh, it's a precept that can be applied to the EU as well as the international community. And it can also apply in a path to build a sustainable solution for, for migration in, in Europe and, and beyond. So let me conclude here. And um, again, thank you very much. And I wish you a very productive um, um, uh, seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Excellency. I mean, I think you have brought uh, very, I mean, such a complex issue in uh, looking from the European perspective. <clears throat> I think you have rightly mentioned that, you know, this is a complex issue. This is also an emotional issue and politically very sensitive issue. Uh, at the same time, when we are looking at the European approach to uh, this migration, uh, there is, of course, very serious issues of competencies between the EU and the member states. And then, you know, the, I think what we really need to look at it, uh, uh, particularly in European studies from both perspectives. One is how Europe is looking, uh, as you said, the positive aspects of migration, because the way the demographic structure within Europe we have. Uh, and, you know, despite all the talks of deglobalization, as Professor Bhaspati Sarkar mentioned, I mean, globalization is continuing, it'll continue. And then migration is also a reality. So within that, and looking at, I think, the within EU India framework, uh, as I was mentioning, we have a very serious migration dialogue. So certain things perhaps can happen, how in meaningful way both countries can also work together. Uh, we'll come back to some of those issues. Uh, uh, may I invite, uh, you know, my internet, uh, my internet uh, connection seems to be unstable. And if something I get disconnected, Professor Bhatri, you may take over. Uh, so may I invite Professor uh, Vinod Khadaria? I mean, as you know, I mean, he has been working on this issue for so many decades. So he's going to talk about uh, Fortress Europe, Blue Card, which in fact, you know, Blue Card is one where, you know, this has been issued, you know, you know, I was doing a study on this. I mean, most of the blue card have been issued to Indians and, you know, uh, particularly because, you know, large number of issues, I mean, have been issued by Germany and within Germany, mainly to IT sectors and other. 
uh, but still, I mean, it still have to take off in many other countries apart from Germany. Uh, so we have also blue card and the COVID-19 lockdown. So this now you have brought another dimension to this EU's migration and enigma. So, so many, uh, I think, uh, issues you are going to touch, uh, Professor Vinod Khadaria. So you have about 20, 25 minutes maximum to speak, uh, Professor Khadaria. Thank you, uh, Professor Sasdeva. I should call you Gulshan, friend, Namaskati, and His Excellency Hugo Astuto. Uh, this is an opportunity, a privilege to speak at this conference of young researchers. It always brings us back to our own teenage and, you know, in the 30s, early 30s, early 20s, and so on. So it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I would like to say that I have the benefit of the earlier conversation, uh, the introduction by Gulshan, then the concept of this conference by Raswati, and of course, the special address of Hugo Astuto. This actually provides a very large canvas of perspective that we need to have when we are looking at migration studies or migration research. Speaking up a thread from Basrati's reference to democracy, and of course, uh, to what was said about by His Excellency Astuto that no issue is unique to any particular place and therefore not even to Europe. I am tempted to share with the young generation a very popular poem, uh, which is put on a plaque under the Statue of Liberty the in a country which also symbolizes, like India, the largest democracy in the world. And I will just read out that couplet. It's well known. Give me your young, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, Tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp besides the golden door. It makes me think, who were these people, the hardest masses, who were yearning to come to the golden door and the darkness was being chewed away by the light of the lamp. It reminds me, it takes me back hundreds of years uh, about the Pilgrim Fathers, and others, and then, of course, in 1800 onwards, the large masses of people who came from Europe to the United States of America. It's a long history. 55 million is the estimate. Some of them came to the Latin America also. We, one can go and dig deeper into those histories. But it tells us the ups and downs of migration. And I call it the topsy-turvy world of migration. And that's why we, I think it's very befitting to say the trends, the shifts, and the perspective. The shifts are very important. And that is happening that's not unique to any particular continent or country. When we look at, for example, immigration, which is the focus of this uh, particular conference, and in the context of Europe, first of all, I would say the counterpart of immigration is emigration, out migration. And that's where Europe started by emigrating to the United States of America. And then when we come to Europe, the cliche that I has put in my title called the Fortress Europe, I tend to ask the question at different points in time, which country or continent has not been a fortress. That actually takes us into the trajectories of migration of countries like Canada, the Somagata Maru incident episode in Canada that happened in 1913, the 1917 
literacy wall test, literacy test wall and liter the literacy test act that was passed in the American Congress, despite three times veto by President Woodrow Wilson at that point in time, and then the white Australian policy. So I think there are enough examples of around the world to look at these ups and downs because today white Australian policy has been phased out. Canada has become multicultural country. United States of America is known to be a nation of immigrants. And so people ask, some researchers ask, has there been a country or a nation of immigrants? And it is also suggested that perhaps Europe could have laid its claim to that expression, it didn't. It's interesting from the point of view of doing research on Europe on uh, other continents and comparative research. So I would like to say, begin by saying that immigration and emigration are counterparts of each other and if we look at this, then we find that even in the United States of America, it was the, the migrants from Europe who, who had dominated till 1966, as far as that. Only after 1968, it was opened to the global South migrants. What is interesting in the context of European Union, I was trying to recall uh, my undergraduate days that it was, it began with the European coal and steel uh, community and then European common market. Why the term European common market? Because the whole issue started with tariffs, with excise, with import and export taxes to protect a particular interest of trade. It is ironical that today we find these barriers shifting from the territory, from the domain of goods and services to human beings. That I think is something that has made us look into the issues as, as a hot potato. Why I'm calling it hot potato is because if we look at the global agendas, then we find migration nowhere look at the Millennium Development Goal, the eight goals do not have migration in it. The Millennium Development Goals were primarily the responsibility of the developing countries, the Global South. The Global North countries were not part of it. We today have Sustainable Development Goals from 2015 to 30. That's where the global North countries are equal partners with equal responsibility. The 17 goals do not have migration in them. We have come a long way to very smartly ignore or avoid the discussion of human mobility on global agenda. So if we look back, then what had happened that Kofi Annan had brought it on the, tried to bring it on the global agenda in 2002 by instituting global commission on international migration for a limited period of three years. And the report, and that was the migration on the agenda piggybacking on the agenda of development. And that's why we have the discourse on migration and development associated with each other. Subsequently, there was a high level dialogue on migration and development in 2006, followed by the first GFMD, uh, which took place in Brussels. And it, was, it has been alternating between a developed country and a developing country since then. I think a couple of years back, it was in Bangladesh and Asia. So we find that global agenda finally has got it after uh, a lot of debates, a lot of efforts that have been put there uh, on large movement of people and refugees as migrants in 2015 onwards that Wilson had mentioned. 
Now it was in 2018 that the Global Compact for Migration, GCM as it is called, was signed by bringing in all the countries, UN member states, excepting that United States had withdrawn even before it was signed. And that was uh, the Trump era, beginning of the Trump era. 2018 onwards, we were hoping that migration, international migration would get priority in the global agenda. And that was interrupted by the by the COVID-19, by the pandemic, because of the lockdown that happened across the world. Now, if we look at this whole stretch of issues, then what we come across are what is the quantum of migration? What is the total number of people who are migrating in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of the percentage of population? If we look at in terms of percentage of population, it is about 3.5% of the people who, of the world population who are not living in their countries of birth. But if you look at the absolute numbers, that's not small. The latest figure that I have is 281 plus millions. That is the number that we got it from International Migration Report, the latest one. The share of Europe, has been very large in this, about 70, 80 million. And that is comparable and all the time contesting with Asia. So you find that sometimes it is Asia which is at the top and sometimes it is Europe. So they are competing, competing with each other in terms of hosting migrants. Can we then call Europe the fortress, fortress Europe? We need to put question mark. The cliches have been there to, to drive our thought in, in one particular direction, but our graduate researchers need to play the role of devil's advocate to the cliches also. That I think is very, very important. If we look at Indian, that India is, India is primarily an emigration country, a, an origin country, a source country. UN data tells us it's about 18 million who people who are living abroad, but I think those are the people who are the non-resident Indians still holding Indian passports. United Nations nomenclature makes a mistake in calling them the largest diaspora. The diaspora is the counterpart of that 18 million, which is which makes it 32 million if you put them together. Those are the people who have become citizens of other countries. And Vaswati had mentioned about issues of citizenship, which actually brings into the focus the issue of dual nationality, dual citizenship, and multiple nationality. Even in Europe, we find that dual nationality has been there, particularly in Germany and other countries are, are also debating this, but it's going to be difficult with every country. India still does not allow dual citizenship, it has a truncated dual citizenship called the OCI, Overseas Citizenship of India, which gives rights, uh, almost all kinds of visa rights, excepting a few that you cannot contest in elections, you cannot have plantation lands and so on. One can go into the details, but the, this 32 million Indian migrants abroad are basically divided into three sectors three global spaces. One is the oldest one, the Southeast Asia, the endangered labor and so on. Then we find another chunk of people, about 20 million in the Gulf countries and about 10 to 12 million in the North America, United States of America, and you know a smaller number in Canada and so on. Of course, in Europe, England has the largest number of Indians because of the colonial connections. So if we look at the quantity, we have these numbers, but what about the quality? And that's where, when Wilson mentioned right in the beginning that the, the component of total migrants have unskilled migrants and skilled migrants, the whole range of people, gender, 
for classification, occupational classification, income classification, and all these indices of data tell us about the character, characteristics of migrants. If we look at that, then we find that the world has been very selective in terms of welcoming the highly skilled migrants and closing the doors on the unskilled migrants. And that's where it's ironical that the Global Commission on International Migration, which submitted its report in 2005, said, and I'm going to quote this, the traditional distinction between skilled and unskilled workers fails to do justice to the complexity of international migration. While they, that is skilled and unskilled workers, may have different levels of educational achievement, all of them could be legitimized, legitimately described as essential workers. This is plain truth. Without one or the other, there can be no production of goods and services, no, 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 nothing would be possible. And if we keep this in mind, then we find that within six years of submission of this report and by 2011, we found all the countries continuing to be highly selected. Not only the global North countries of developed world, but also the less developed countries and the least developed. So the onus lies on the migration policy being skewed in one direction. That I think is the challenge that amongst the many challenges, that His Excellency Astuto had referred to. Why this is happening? This is happening because what I call, tend to call the dynamic conflict of interest in my vision. And I call it a trinity of conflicts. Why this trinity? And I call it a trinity of, I tend to rhyme it out for the benefit of making it memorable, easy to remember, the trinity of age, wage, and vintage. The age is what was mentioned in terms of the demographic structure of the population. It's aging in Europe. So Europe requires younger migrants. And the migrants also age with time. So they need to be, to be, they need to be turned over. And that's why we find that slowly, permanent migration policy is replaced by temporary migration policy called circular migration. In the name of return migration, in the name of circular migration, we get all this in the name of brain gain, which used to be the counterpart of brain drain. Now return migration is called brain gain, which are you know, part of the toxic world of the discourse. Similarly, the wage component is very important. Highly skilled workers are needed but because they are going, getting younger and younger, their wages are also becoming smaller and smaller. The total wage bill of the companies pay less to the younger workers, younger migrant workers than to the older people. So they are giving a golden handshake, retirement, voluntary retirement and all that, because it keeps the cost of production of goods and services low and gives a comparative advantage to these countries in the world trade. The same com commodity, if produced by senior people, then the cost of production is going to be higher. That is the wage component. And finally, the vintage is in terms of the latest technology, knowledge in technology that is embodied among students. Not you and I, our generation does not have that embodiment. It is you on the other side, the young researchers that the world is after. That's why we have the, the education fairs that are taking place in metro cities at least four times a year to give admission to recruit. They call it recruitment. They don't call it enrollment. And I think that's a Freudian slip because what the countries and the companies have in mind at the back of their mind are future workers and not the students. The future workers with latest technology, latest knowledge. If we look at the ratio of return migration of younger people, of students, then 60 to 80% of those who are completing their higher degrees up to the PhD level 
do not come back to their home countries. They have their intention. They want to stay. 80% want to stay back and 60% actually are able to stay back. And they are, they are welcoming. In fact, Obama in his 2014 State of the Nation address had shared this concern that are we, are we actually educating these people, young people in our universities and countries only to compete against us, only to go back and compete against us. And that was actually driving force behind the policy of tax cuts, you know, tax holidays to the industries to the extent that if the American companies open their offices in Bangalore rather than in Buffalo, then they will not get the tax incentives. So this is what drives the migration is connected with world trade, was connected with other policy that we need to understand in terms of conflicts of interest when we look at, at these issues. So finally, because we do not have enough time to go into these issues, I have flagged this issue for the young researchers to reflect on them and debate about these issues. You need not accept what I am saying. You must question me and question everybody else. And your questions may not have answers. That I think is the hallmark of good research. So finally, where are we today? And I call it that we are, uh, we are in the world of GCM, Global Compact for Migration. And there is a parallel Global Compact for Refugees. But Global Compact for Migration has 23 objectives. How many of them and which ones are relevant to the country that you are studying? How many are relevant to the Global South? How many are relevant to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or other countries or Philippines? That I think is important. We need not concede to the fact that all 23 are relevant. The overall objective of GCM is to make migration soar, I call it soar, safe, orderly, and regular. Now that's where I find wheels within wheels. And we need to address that. I say there are at least three tyrannies which are hidden in small print in calling them safe, orderly, and regular. What is safe? Safe is securitization. Securitization that Wilson had mentioned right in the beginning. Making it safe means security, and security has its own ramifications. Travel restrictions are part of that. What are the norms of travel restrictions? Are they equitable all over the world? Visa issues, are they equitable all over the world? There are so many countries where you, people can travel without visa, and so many countries where there's where they have to wait for six months to get a visa. That is the tyranny of calling it safe, which is actually security. Orderly, orderly is actually social cohesion. That is inbuilt in the policy of integration. Now, integration is not one-sided. It is considered the integration, the responsibility of integration lies not only with immigrants, but also with the citizens who are the host. So the integration it has to be from both sides. That I think is important when you talk about human rights, when you talk about identity. And I've seen the stretch, the, the range of topics that this conference is going to cover. It's actually touching upon all these issues. And finally, I would say regular. What is regular? I was actually the um, I was actually the you know expert in the second debate on GCM in New York at the United Nations, and my task was to listen to the debate over two days from all the member states and summarize it and make my own recommendations at the end of that. So I had to burn midnight oil and to you know, make it comprehensive. And that is where I had asked, I had asked, I understand what is safe, what is regular. 
and what is, but I don't understand what is orderly. It was a tongue in cheek question that I had put, not that I didn't know the answer. And somebody very naively answered one of the member states' representatives it is the opposite of disorderly. And everybody just laughed. I said, well, that was the catch, you know, and you had fallen for it. So when we say so regular, it is actually sovereignty. That's where the visa regime. Now, visa regime is something which is the hottest potato. Nobody wants to touch that. Nobody wants to discuss that. It never comes on the multilateral negotiations table. And that is where I think a lot of issues are important. How frequently are visa regimes changing? How, how, what, how are their clauses changing? What are the fees? What are the you know, terms and conditions that I think are very much important in terms of understanding the topsy-turvy world of migration that we are trying to understand in the context of Europe. And that's where I think you find the regions, the find the causes and consequences of going up and down. In developing a perspective, I would say question the cliches. Don't accept them on face value. Come up, come up with antithesis. You create a thesis, but come up with antithesis. What is counterintuitive? Try to find what is counterintuitive. Ask a question. This is very intuitive. This is nothing new. This is tautology. The opposite of tautology is something which is counterintuitive. I would like to leave you with this open question. Uh, and I hope that during the next two days, you have a very fruitful session and very interesting debate that I think would become the hallmark of uh, the, this department in JNU, my dear university. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, in fact, you know, Professor Kadaria, you really provided a really a comprehensive view of uh, the issue, which is what exactly we expected from you in a, such a short uh, time. Uh, you know, the issues of ups and downs of migration, what you said, and uh, you also rightly asked the question, which country has not been a fortress? It's not just only about a Europe fortress. I mean, you talk about any country. Uh, and despite the, you know, the issue dominating global agenda, not just European agenda, how this was missing from MDGs and also from SDGs. I mean, this is, I think I never really thought about this earlier. And, uh, and you also very rightly pointed out, I mean, the whole, the distinction uh, between skilled and unskilled, it's very problematic. I mean, it's not that simple that, you know, we'll just select, select, I mean, skilled one and unskilled one. And, the, you know, you have also brought this safe, orderly and regular, uh, I mean, uh, regular kind of you know, issues. I mean, we keep using some of these terms without actually knowing what uh, and how cleverly sometimes these things have been used by policymakers in different countries. So this is really the task of uh, our uh, research scholars to look into all these issues which you have pointed out. Uh, of course, within the context of Europe and India, EU, this is what our uh, mandate is. Uh, you know, I'm really thankful to all our speakers. I mean, uh, they have all of the, uh, been, you know, within the time limit, which has been allotted to them. So I have absolutely no problem in managing this particular session. So now may I just invite uh, our research scholar, uh, uh, Mr. Nikhil Sehra, who is doing PhD in the center to propose a word of thanks. Nikhil. Thank you, Professor Gulshan. Uh, before I start, I would like to remind all our attendees to fill up the form that has been shared on the chat room, which will be shared again so that your certificate of participation will be ready by the end of the conference. Thank you. Uh, Prof uh, Ambassador Ugo, I think, has been disconnected because of some technical issue, but however, I'll lead on. Uh, I, on behalf of the conference organizing team, take this opportunity to thank His Excellency Ambassador Ugo Astuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India, to have graced this occasion and inaugurated and addressed the Young Researchers Conference. His views are immensely inspiring and insightful for us young researchers. I would like to extend gratitude towards Professor Binod Khadaria for sparing his time and expressing his views on EU's migration and 
protruding towards the theme of the conference. Uh, thank, I would like to thank the Dean of the school, Professor Ashwini Mohapatra, our School of International Studies and our esteemed university for support and cooperation. Um, our heartfelt thanks to Chairperson of the Center for European Studies, Professor Gulshin Sajdeva, uh, and the faculty of the center, Professor Musalma Bhava, Dr. Sheetal Sharma, Dr. S. Prasad, Dr. Taibor Lang, Dr. Shakti Prasad. Uh, other esteemed uh, faculty which is present here with us from the School of International Studies and from the university, I thank you for uh, being part of this inaugural. Uh, I must not be forgetful in thanking the organizer of this event, Jean Monnet Chair, Professor Vasuki Sarkar, with the support of Erasmus Plus program of the European Union who organized this and made this happen. Uh, lastly, and not the least, the conference secretariat, Sanskriti Debanjali and Chosumbul and Yash for being behind the curtains and making this possible. Thank you, everyone. And we would continue to the first session, the first working session, which will, which is on European Union's immigration and asylum policy, which will be chaired by Gulshan, Professor Gulshan Sachdeva and Dr. Satyanar and Prasad together. Okay, uh, thank you. Since we have uh, finished our time, so I, uh, I close this session now, and uh, I think it, there is some uh, gap, eleven to eleven ten, some or we. There's a coffee break at return. Yeah, there's a tea coffee break till 11 10, and then we can come back. We'll meet back again at, I mean, we'll continue. I mean, don't disconnect yourself because that will create problem. So continue to be connected, but there's a five minutes break now instead of 10 minutes. So 11 10, we'll meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Gulshan. Thank you, Vasati. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All Thank the you. best. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Yes, come in. Sir, your mic is on.
Oh, you know. 